Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Mary Lee Watts. I am the American Society for Microbiology's Director of Federal Affairs, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And now I will turn it over to Alan Siegel, ASM's Director of Policy and Advocacy, who will make opening remarks and introduce today's speakers. Thank you. As Mary Lee mentioned, I'm Alan Siegel, ASM's Director of Public Policy and Advocacy. Uh, thank you, Mary Lee, and to the entire ASM advocacy team for putting this program together today. And a special thanks to the CDC team, especially uh, Greg Armstrong and his colleagues for making themselves available for this important briefing, uh, and to all of you for attending today. ASM members have been on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19. This includes clinical microbiologists developing and conducting COVID-19 tests to those in labs conducting basic and clinical research, as well as virologists racing to develop new vaccines. ASM's 30,000 members are hard at work to help address this crisis and the public health needs of the future. One quick programming note, starting next week, the American Society for Microbiology is launching a three-part virtual briefing series to bring you the latest on diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutic developments for COVID-19. This series, along with today's briefing, are part of ASM's efforts to provide policymakers with the best science available to understand the current pandemic and the broader issues within, and broader issues within the microbial sciences. Now on to today's program. CDC is leading the way to bring pathogen genomics to the front lines of public health through the Advanced Molecular Detection, or AMD, program. Advanced molecular detection allows scientists to detect diseases faster, identify outbreaks sooner, and protect people from emerging and evolving disease threats. It informs vaccine development, helps identify and track antimicrobial resistance, and helps advance the development of diagnostics for new and emerging diseases. During non-pandemic times, this technology is used for, to, uh, for everything from improving our response to seasonal flu to tracking outbreaks of foodborne illness. During the current pandemic, AMD technologies have played a critical role. Thanks to this technology, CDC scientists were able to sequence the genome of the novel coronavirus in under a week and made this information available to the public through a global database. Contrast that with the months that it took to sequence the SARS-1 virus in the early 2000s when we did not have this technology. Uh, the new Sequencing for Public Health Emergency Response Epidemiology and Surveillance, or SPHERES Consortium, developed by CDC, is a great example of how CDC is leveraging and building on existing AMT infrastructure and expertise to bolster our response to COVID-19. We are excited uh, to share with you information about the SPHERES, SPHERES program today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Greg Armstrong. Greg leads CDC's Advanced Molecular Detection Program, which is a $30 million per year innovation and modernization program established in 2014. Through Greg's leadership, CDC has brought next generation genomic sequencing, bioinformatics, and related technology into public health in the United States. Greg has been playing an integral role in CDC's COVID-19 response, serving since February as Chief, Chief Science Officer for the agency response. He is architect of the unique consortium you will hear about in a moment. Duncan McCannell is the Chief Science Officer for CDC's AMD office, where he helps coordinate the implementation and support of pathogen genomics, bioinformatics, high-performance computing, and other innovative laboratory technologies across the CDC's four infectious disease centers. Thank you. Dr. Armstrong, I now turn the program over to you. First off, um, I want to say thank you to ASM for hosting this webinar today and to CDC's partners for helping to, to spread the word. And uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us today. Um, as, uh, as Alan mentioned, the, uh, the Advanced Molecular Detection Program, or AMD program, is, uh, is a program that was established by Congress in 2014 with the objective of bringing next generation DNA sequencing, or uh, NGS, into, uh, and, and bioinformatics to bear against infectious disease threats 
uh, at CDC and in uh, local and in, in state health departments. In other words, throughout the entire um, U.S. public health system. Um, our budget is about uh, $30 million per year. And um, as of uh, 2019, uh, next generation sequencing is in use uh, in all of CDC's infectious disease laboratories and in all state uh, public health labs um, uh, around the United States. Um, for those of you who want to, who have more of a technical background and, and want a little more um, depth in this, uh, we recently published a review article in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so the reason our, our, our program came about um, was this, this, this technology that I mentioned, next generation sequencing, had come around around 2005 and was really transforming how, um, how we understand uh, genomics, uh, both uh, human genomics, but also uh, importantly for us, uh, microbial genomics. And, um, uh, uh, but by uh, 2013, U.S. public health had made relatively little progress uh, in this area. There were some uh, um, investments that we needed to make in order to, to get over that hump, in order to be able to um, reap the benefits of this, this new technology. And so um, if you fast forward from 2013, after um, six years of investment in the AMD program, we're in a completely different uh, position now, where next generation sequencing is being used um, throughout all of, uh, all of CDC's infectious disease labs. In fact, it's being used for every um, infectious disease of, of, of public health importance at, at this point. Among the, the ones that are listed up there for bacterial foodborne illness, for example, um, we're using it to detect outbreaks earlier so that we can intervene and uh, be able to more effectively solve those outbreaks and trace those back to their source and understand how these pathogens are getting into the food system in the first place. With TB, we're getting a better understanding of transmission. Influenza, we're getting much more data, viral hepatitis, malaria, streptococcal diseases, antimicrobial resistance. Um, any of these areas and more, uh, this technology is really transforming how we do public health uh, in the United States. Just to um, just to put a couple of visuals on this, this is uh, uh, from one of those examples, influenza, where with next generation sequencing, we're getting a much, much finer picture of how the virus is emerging um, in populations, not just here in the U.S., but, but all over the world. And um, this is giving us a much better um, uh, picture of how the, the pathogen emerges. And uh, one of the important consequences of this is that um, as a result of that, we're actually developing a lot more candidate uh, vaccine viruses that we believe are is putting us in a much better position um, to respond to uh, emergence of, of pandemic influenza, for example. Um, in addition, uh, uh, sequencing is becoming increasingly portable using a variety of technologies. This is an example where we... Uh, we sent out a small team to work with the state veterinarian um, to investigate influenza transmission among swine at a uh, at, at, at a pig fair, and um, uh, this investigation actually uh, discovered a virus that we we later ended up seeing in in, in humans. So. Um, uh, one of the most important um, aspects of next generation sequencing is that it um, really puts us in a much better position to respond to, to, to outbreaks, um, uh, both in uh, detecting the outbreaks, uh, but also in, in, in understanding uh, transmission and in uh, figuring out how to respond to those outbreaks. And um, uh, uh, so when uh, SARS-CoV-2 hit, when, when, when uh, COVID-19 hit the United States, uh, the first question I got, I happened to be giving a presentation at the time, was will sequencing be used in, in responding to this, uh, to the pandemic? And, and the answer was an easy one, uh, yes. And uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, Duncan McCannell, who you're about to hear from, um, very quickly got up this initiative. He, he told me that um, he thought uh, he'd be able to get 100 or 150 people involved in it. I, I told him I thought that was maybe a little bit ambitious, but um, 
Right now, I, I think he's got well over 400 involved in this, as well as um, uh, more than 100 different organizations. And um, so that's what uh, Duncan's going to talk about today is, is the SPHERES initiative. And let me hand this over to uh, Duncan. Uh, thanks, Greg, and, and welcome, everyone. In the early days of the outbreak, or in the early days of the pandemic in the U.S., um, a lot of the sequencing was being done at CDC. And part of the reason for that was that samples were coming to CDC for confirmatory testing. So many of the sequences or many of the samples that tested positive were subsequently sequenced and submitted into GenBank and GISAID very, very early on and very rapidly. Um, we, we really felt there was a huge value in ensuring that those sequences are out there for, for uh, basic research and public health purposes. Uh, and But, you know, we essentially had a single point of... Uh, uh, to funnel the, the samples through. Uh, that changed on March 14th when uh, the FDA discontinued uh, the, uh, the recommendation that uh, the confirmatory testing be conducted at CDC and confirmed, and a lot of the testing was m much more distributed throughout the country. And as a result, a lot of the samples weren't necessarily being sequenced directly. At the same time, uh, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me back up and let me talk a little bit about uh, about the coronavirus itself, and then we'll talk a little bit about the history of the, uh, the program. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is uh, uh, from the same family as MERS and SARS. Uh, the reference genome, uh, usually they, they trend around 30,000 uh, 30, uh, base pairs. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was first identified in Wuhan province, China in late 2019, and is likely a natural spillover from bats. The first genome was deposited to GenBank on uh, January 5th, uh, to 2020 by uh, Yang Zhang Zhang and uh, colleagues at uh, the Shanghai Public uh, Public Health Clinical Center. Uh, and the first U.S. case was uh, identified, actually that's a typo, it was uh, January 21st, uh, 2020. Um, just some basic, uh, some basic background on how we study viral sequences, though, uh, or how, uh, how mutations occur so that you can perhaps understand some of the phylogenetics uh, that we'll discuss a little later. First, you have to understand that as the virus transmits and replicates through the world, uh, it accumulates changes in its genetic code. Uh, for, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it's about two changes every month, or one change every two weeks. Uh, we can monitor these changes or monitor for new variants uh, and use these patterns of changes to understand and track how the virus spreads. Uh, but there isn't really any, uh, any evidence at this point for differences in virulence or infectiousness. So um, it's something that we're very closely monitoring. So the question is, why, why, do we, why should we sequence SARS-CoV-2 at scale? Um, there's some, some obvious suggestions there, or some obvious reasons there. First, uh, to monitor viral diversity over time. Uh, it's important to understand transmission dynamics. What's, where are strains coming from and where are they going? Uh, this can help inform public health responses. It can help drive contact tracing and overall containment and mitigation strategy, uh, particularly if we can get genomic data into the hands of frontline public health responders quickly. Uh, we can also use it to monitor what the virus is doing. Uh, we can look for the emergence of clinically important variants. Uh, we can look for unusual variant, uh, virulence uh, and uh, anything that might indicate that there's some potential disruption of any of the diagnostic, uh, antigenic, or therapeutic targets. So anything that might affect how we diagnose uh, cases, uh, how we potentially treat cases, or they might affect how a vaccine uh, might, might work on them. Uh, it's also important to look more broadly and establish some national and regional baselines. Uh, by setting up sustainable longitudinal data collection, uh, we can really balance out sampling over the country and get a, a real understanding of uh, essentially a viral weather report of what, uh, what strains are circulating, where they're going, uh, and how they're getting there. Uh, it also uh, allows us to compare regions with different timelines and response strategies. So we can actually overlay, potentially overlay some of this transmission data, some of the, the data we get from viral genomics uh, with how public health policy is actually working at the state and, and local level. Uh, to, to understand, um, you know, what impact those are having on, on chains of transmission. Uh, and most importantly, as we start spinning up a large activity like this, it brings in new collaborators uh, and it brings in new innovative ideas. Uh, and those have all been absolutely critical, uh, at least in our experience with the AMD program, uh, in meeting uh, not only the current challenge, but also challenges ahead. So, uh, you know, uh, at the end of April, we announced uh, the SPHERES initiative. Um, and let me talk a little bit about what that is and what it does. 
Uh, so we, as sequencing changed, or as as the uh, as the pandemic started to unfold, we we started to take a poll of many of the public health departments that we work with, uh, state and local public health departments, to understand uh, their intentions around sequencing uh, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, many were very interested. Uh, you know, we've spent the past uh, five or six years building bioinformatics and genomics capacity uh, across the U.S. public health system, uh, and so we really had a strong foundation to build on. Uh, that said, you know, many public health departments were also uh, grappling with uh, with frontline primary diagnostic testing and how to ensure that that was delivered reliably. So something like sequencing was maybe a secondary priority. Uh, as of today, we have about 27 public health departments, state public health departments that are taking part in the consortium, uh, and about 17 county and local public health departments, mostly California counties and, uh, and D.C. We also have a number of our, our, uh, our, our good federal partners, uh, NCBI at the National Library of Medicine, uh, NIAID, uh, FDA, and NIST, uh, APL, of course. Uh, but one of the interesting new things is uh, a whole raft of new potential partners. You know, as we started going out to the states, as we started going out to the, the local public health departments around sequencing, uh, we discovered that there were many academic centers, there were many clinical centers, many groups in the private sector that were either already sequencing uh, public health uh, uh, actionable samples or uh, interested in providing uh, resources and support around this. Uh, and so it really made sense to set up a consortium to help drive this and support it. As it stands, the, uh, the SPHERES Consortium has uh, 442 scientists from across the country participating uh, and roughly 109 organizations. So as Greg said, it really has already exceeded our, our expectations um, and uh, has really started to, to provide value. Uh, the overall goal of the consortium is really simply to maximize the quality, quantity, and usefulness of the sequence data that we're driving. You know, we have a number of experienced public health groups that are generating uh, useful sequence data. Uh, we also have a number of labs that have not necessarily participated in these kinds of public health responses before. And so establishing some ground rules around uh, data and metadata or information about the data, how to submit those sequences, where to submit them, where to how to ensure that the data that they're generating generates the most uh, public health and research impact. Uh, it also is an opportunity to uh, to coordinate with uh, a lot of our um, a lot of our international collaborators. Uh, there have been fairly large consortiums recently announced in the UK and Canada. Uh, there's an emerging effort uh, on the African continent with Africa CDC, uh, and so coordinating our efforts with them ensures that as we start collecting uh, data across the United States. Uh, we're also taking into account uh, what's happening internationally and globally and trying to align a lot of our data processes, where the data is going, how we're storing it, uh, how we're able to compare it uh, is compatible with other countries around the world and other efforts around the world. So the consortium itself has several main goals. Uh, one, it brings together a network of laboratories uh, under a single massive and coordinated public health sequencing effort. You know, at the beginning, we essentially had a situation where we had uh, many small boats, some small boats, some very large boats, uh, but they were all uh, all rowing in different directions. Uh, this allows us to establish some coordination among the groups. We're trying to have a fairly light touch in terms of how we actually manage that. Uh, we're not trying to, uh, to control how they're sequencing. Uh, as long as the quality of the data is good and the, the results that they have are consistent with, with consortium standards. It also allows us to identify and prioritize uh, not only the capabilities of this network. You know, across this network, we have some incredible capability in terms of sequencing capacity, uh, academic expertise, uh, bioinformatic resources, uh, and other assets that we can potentially use. Uh, and figuring out how to actually pool that and, and drive those resources towards areas of need is, is something that, uh, that the network provides. Uh, it also allows us to coordinate those, as I said, coordinate those effort, those, or, those resources much better and uh, gives us some resilience in case uh, a lab needs to, uh, to deprioritize sequencing for a while. Uh, we have a mechanism to make sure that those samples can continue to get sequenced if, if there's value in doing that. Uh, really, the core of the consortium, though, is around rapid open data sharing. Uh, we're really driving the idea of openness. We're driving standards-based uh, analysis and rapid data sharing. Uh, we really believe that this is absolutely critical to, uh, to the global public health response and I think and absolutely critical to how we're responding to the, uh, the pandemic here in the United States. 
Um, so as part of that, we're submitting data to multiple repositories. There's GISAID, which is one of the, the large repositories that, uh, that, is, that data is being submitted to internationally. Uh, we're also submitting data to NCBI, the National Library of Medicine, uh, to ensure that uh, not only are consensus sequences uh, available, but also a lot of the raw data that's coming off the sequences, uh, because we think that there's a lot more useful information and a lot more things that people can do with those data if they're available. Uh, the network also gives a way to share a lot of the protocols, methods, bioinformatic tools, and best practices, so it's, it's really a, a good knowledge bank for, for groups that have differing levels of expertise. Uh, and allows us to establish some common ways of actually doing things, ensuring that the data gets where it needs to go quickly uh, and it gets into the hands of decision makers as quickly as possible. So as of today, uh, uh, this is the GISAID uh, uh, public uh, database. Uh, there's about six, just over 6,000 sequences from across the United States, uh, and nearly all of those are from SPHERES member labs. So we've been pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive in our outreach as we identify find new groups that we perhaps have been unaware of, we try and bring them into the fold. Uh, really, this is an organizational and data management effort, um, but it also allows us to, to prioritize some of the resources that we have available for sequencing. So how is this data used once it's, it's pushed into the public domain? Uh, this is a, uh, a screen capture from, uh, from NextDrain, which many of you may have seen. Uh, it's developed by uh, Trevor Bedford and uh, Richard Nair uh, and uh, a small army of, of colleagues. Uh, and actually recently, actually as of yesterday, I think it won a Webby Award, a special Webby Award for as a, as a data visualization tool. Uh, what you're looking at here, though, is a, uh, is a, a tabulation of all the, uh, the sequences in the public domain across, from across the United States that are available. Um, it, uh, it shows uh, how they're related. It shows a, it, how they're related over time. Uh, and as you can see on the right with the, the, uh, the map, it, it can give you a sense of what the, what the overall patterns of transmission may be. Uh, this can be absolutely invaluable information at a national level, and there have been a few papers from consortium members that have really tracked uh, the, uh, the spread of some of these, uh, these uh, viral variants across the country. Um, and it can also be absolutely invaluable at the local level. This is a, another view uh, that's maintained by uh, Nathan Grubaugh's lab at the, the Yale School of Public Health, where they've essentially uh, taken the same, same dashboard, the same open data, uh, but really started to look at it at a very granular local level. So they could understand what is happening in terms of transmission, in terms of strain type dynamics uh, within the state of Connecticut. Uh, these are powerful tools for us, and it helps us understand uh, where the virus is going, how it's getting there, and uh, ideally where we can put in effective public health measures to, uh, to slow it down and stop it. The other thing that is absolutely uh, invaluable with open data is you know, by providing all this data for public health and basic research, it enables a, uh, essentially a global uh, array of tools. Uh, this is a website from, uh, from Patrick Chain's group at Los Alamos National Labs, who's, uh, who's also a member of the SPHERES Consortium. Uh, what they have been doing is essentially taking all of the publicly available sequence data from the U.S. and globally uh, and comparing it against, in, in, in silico, in, in, in the computer, against all uh, publicly available PCR uh, uh, probes and primers, so all of the, the available diagnostic assays. What this lets us do is really understand how, uh, you know, given the current circulating viruses, given the emerging viruses, uh, which PCR tests are actually working pretty well or likely to be working pretty well, which ones may have issues. Uh, and it allows us to monitor whether there are changes in, uh, in the overall viral, uh, viral patterns that are circulating, whether there's an imp the potential impact on how, uh, how effective our diagnostic strategies are working. So in summary, uh, the SPHERES Consortium really builds on existing AMD investments. The fact that we've been able to stand this up very quickly really relies on the fact that we've, uh, we've built a significant bioinformatics and genomics capacity across the United States and have a strong public health uh, lab laboratory foundation to start building on. Uh, we are maximizing as much data submission as we possibly can. We want to ensure that the data that we collect is useful and that it gets into the hands of decision makers as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're really centering this initiative on open data, open standards-based data. Uh, when you gather these types of data, you can figure out patterns of viral transmission, you can detect important changes in circulating viruses, 
Uh, and ideally, if you can get the information into, into the hands of frontline public health staff fast enough, uh, you can inform and direct public health responses and infection control at a, at a very granular and local level. Uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight is that this is really a fairly new ground. Uh, this, the scope of this public health, public-private partnership is really unusual for public health. Uh, but we feel that it does bring together uh, world-class expertise, institutions, and innovators, uh, and gives them a common goal and a shared, uh, shared purpose. We think that high-quality open sequence data will accelerate basic research and public health responses, uh, and will really prepare us not only for this public health pandemic threat, but also the next one. Uh, this has been our experience before uh, in the pre-pandemic period with AMD. A lot of what we've done is making sure that the data that we generate across the U.S. public health system is widely available for both research and public health, uh, and it certainly is starting to pay dividends here in, in helping us understand uh, and plan and respond to what we're seeing. With that, uh, I will open it up. Uh, I think we have some some posted questions, but uh, I Great. would welcome well, questions. Great. Well, thank you there. so much, uh, Dr. Armstrong and Dr. McCannell, for this um, wonderful presentation. So um, I think we'll start with you, Greg, but um, certainly this is a question for both of you. Um, so could you tell us more about the importance of the AMD program at CDC, how it really changed um, the kind of work that you could do there when it was enacted a few years ago, and especially as it's related to emerging viruses over the last few years, including COVID-19? In the infectious disease world, the, the world of public health infectious diseases, um, the technology or these technologies, next generation sequencing and bioinformatics, have really been transformative. Um, you know, they, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, when, when, when you go back to 2013, 2014, just, just before the AMD program was, was started, I can tell you there was a tremendous amount of frustration um, here at the agency at, at, at CDC, um, but also um, uh, in public health agencies around the U.S. because they could see so much potential for 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 this technology. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, DNA fingerprinting. You know, it um, uh, 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 we've used various technologies to essentially do DNA fingerprinting of pathogens over the years, um, different technologies for foodborne disease, for um, TB, for antimicrobial resistant infections, um, for, for various viruses. Um, the nice thing about sequencing is that it not only is applicable across the entire spectrum, um, the, the, the one technology, but it also just gives us a, a, a so much finer picture um, <clears throat> than we've been able to get before. So with foodborne disease, for example, um, we used to track uh, foodborne illness in the U.S. using something called pulse field gel electrophoresis, which was an analog technology that would give you maybe 12 or 24 bands on a gel. And, uh, you know, we used that. It was actually um, quite effective in its, in, its, in its time. It really did change how we do foodborne disease surveillance in, in the United States. But we've gone from 12 to 24 uh, bands on a gel to looking at all 5 million nucleotides in, in, in the genome. And uh, this uh, not only gives us extremely, an extremely fine fingerprint of, 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 of the pathogen, it gives us so much more confidence um, that cases um, um, that look to be part of an outbreak are actually part of that outbreak. And when we trace it back um, to its food source that we can say with, with a high degree of confidence that, that, um, that the, you know, the, 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 the pathogen that caused that outbreak came, came from, from, from that food source. So, um, and that's, that's just one area. It's, you know, um, so uh, 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 there's usually, you know, when a new technology comes along in, in any scientific area or, or definitely in, in public health, there's usually a certain amount of skepticism about, uh, about it. And it's, it, it, usually the uptake is a little bit slow. It's, it's been exactly the opposite here. Uh, people were very excited about it from the beginning um, all over the U.S. public health system and have been very uh, quick to adopt it. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Great. 
just maybe to add on one one more thing. Um, you know, we we spoke a little bit about how uh, you know invest investments in state and local public health labs around AMD have really set a good foundation for a lot of uh, a lot of this response. An example of that really comes out of Foodborne. You know, one of the uh, one of the programs that we we have is called the uh, Bioinformatic Regional Resource, which uh, which supports bioinformaticians and uh, training across the country. Uh, as part of that, you know, we built a, a network of bioinformaticians and uh, and skilled uh, people that are skilled in pathogen genomics around the country. Uh, one of the things that they did very early on in the uh, in the pandemic is to uh, to develop a set of protocols for sequencing the virus that were based on um, or that were adapted for labs that were already set up to do standard foodborne testing. So labs that were already set up for PulseNet, uh, which is 86, 87 laboratories around the country, have a standard set of equipment, standard set of protocols that they follow. Uh, and so the Staff B, or State Public Health Bioinformatics Group, uh, actually put together a set of protocols that, uh, that enabled them to use a lot of the equipment and reagents that they already had on hand uh, for viral sequencing, uh, which was a uh, an easy way to pivot and set up many of the public health labs to actually provide. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, how are you, so coming back to the SPHERES consortium, how are you working with companies developing therapeutics and vaccines to ensure that their products would be effective across strains? And it's interesting, we had a similar question come in that talked about, you know, if the virus is mutating, what does that mean for vaccines? So, so maybe it's a little bit of a two-part question there. We can, we can do that one as a two-part question, and I'd be happy to handle that one. Uh, for one thing, you know, I, th I think if you did a poll of virologists, um, I, I think the general consensus is that we're st we still have a single strain of SARS-CoV-2. What we do have are sequence variants. Uh, the virus itself has uh, has proofreading capability, and it accumulates mutations pretty slowly. And so, usually, when we're talking about differences between uh, different viral variants, we're we're talking about one or two positions in the genome uh, that may be definitive, that may dis distinguish them. Um, there has been some airtime recently, or some some discussion recently around some of those mutations and what they may imply. Uh, about the ability of the virus to bind to uh, to uh, the human host cell, um, but uh, I think a lot of that we don't necessarily have the functional data or, or data that actually show that it has that that functional impact. Uh, we have a lot of computer modeling suggesting it may have that role, uh, and we don't necessarily have a lot of data yet. Um, sequencing at, at large scale though lets us monitor for those kinds of things and identify some of these mutations that may be important. Uh, and identify variants that may have uh, have concerning effects, so that we can actually specifically look for them and uh, understand uh, where they're coming from. Uh, the consortium itself also gives a really good foundation for uh, for spin-off studies. So there's a number of consortium members now uh, that are doing deep dive clinical studies or looking at very specifically at outcomes or uh, matching a lot of what we're seeing on the viral genomic side to uh, to host genomics. So it's um, it's really providing a foundation for a lot of that follow-on work. Uh, for the second part of that two-part question, uh, how are we working with uh, uh, companies that are developing therapeutics and vaccines? Um, really, what we're trying to do is put the best possible data in their hands. Um, right now, uh, a lot of the globally generated data is, is what I call what is called consensus sequence. So it's just the average sequence that you pull off the sequencer, um, and uh, it's shared through a, uh, a public database called GISAID, which has um, some, some very understandable restrictions around how the data is used and how it's shared. Um, these are put in place largely to, under, to protect the, uh, the intellectual property rights of the submitters uh, and make a lot of sense. But, you know, when it comes to a uh, pandemic situation, ensuring that we have the, most, the broadest, uh, most rich uh, data set available for all parties. Uh, that's why we're submitting data to multiple repositories. So we're ensuring that by putting these data into NCBI and into the INSDC, which is the uh, um, the uh, global network of re public repositories that includes uh, ENA or EBI and uh, DDBJ in, in Europe and Japan, uh, we're ensuring that these sequences are broadly available and they can be used for commercial uh, and therapeutic development, uh, commercial therapeutic development without any sorts of restrictions. 
Uh, I should add, just as a final point, that, uh, that both the UK as well as the Canadian efforts are, are behaving are uh, planning similar releases of data. So ensuring that the data goes into GISAID, uh, but also are submitting to, uh, to NCBI or ENA to ensure that uh, the data that is generated by these national efforts is broadly and, and widely and, uh, available for all purposes. So if there is... So, uh, let me just add, the, um, in the EMD program, we've, we've made a commitment from the beginning to, uh, to open data um, so that um, you know, most of the data that, that, that we're generating through the EMD program is actually made public almost immediately like all that foodborne disease data, all of the influenza data, the TB data. Actually, there's a little bit of a delay in the TB data, but uh, um, most of the other data goes out um, actually very quickly. And for those of you, who, who, of you who don't work in this area, these these data are really the raw materials now for um, for a lot of diagnostic development. So. Um, Anybody who's developing a molecular diagnostic, for example, needs to know, um, you know, how much diversity of virus there is out there, so that um, when they develop their their diagnose their diagnostic, they can be um, confident that um, that um, that it will be able to, to pick up all all the different strains if 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 there are different strains out, out there um, of, of of the virus. And so, uh, making all this data um, uh, available publicly through these public databases um, really helps industry in developing diagnostics, and developing vaccines, and in, in developing therapeutics. So, um, Craig and Duncan, if there is a laboratory or a company that would like to join the SPHERES consortium, um, how do they know if they're eligible? I mean, how can they go about uh, working with all of you? The short answer is, uh, so you can search for the SPHERES consortium just by searching for CDC SPHERES, uh, and that should bring you to the webpage. Um, usually, the first step is contacting the AMD uh, mailbox, which is actually posted on the page, uh, or it's just oamd at cdc.gov. Um, we'd be happy to, to talk to anyone that's, that's interested. Um, we've really structured this as an open consortium, and, uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, the participation makes sense, that, uh, that uh, the participants are, some, are groups that are actually able to contribute meaningfully or that they will get something useful out of their engagement with the, uh, with the consortium. So, um, yeah, first step is a conversation, but uh, generally we're, we're very open Oh, we have we have open arms. We we think that all contributions are wonderful. Um, so we we know that there has been have been a number of um, efforts by Congress over the last few weeks to um, to fund various um, responses to the COVID nineteen pandemic. So wondering if uh, AMD or the Spheres Consortium consortium uh, received any funding from Congress through these supplemental packages. Um, and if it was able to to benefit from this uh, extra assistance, I, 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 I can take that as well. So, so not directly. Um, uh, 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 funding hasn't come, you know, uh, to the MD directly. But I, I can say that the that assistance um, to to state health departments and, and to CDC um, is actually going to go a long ways towards. Um, in, in enabling, especially the state health departments, to be able to use this this technology. So, um, and I think this is actually going to be quite important in the upcoming months. You know, when when you look back, um, for example, at um, at um, uh, Ebola virus. Um, so th that came up just as we were getting uh, next generation sequencing up and running the uh, the the I'm talking specifically about the outbreak that occurred in in West Africa from uh, 2014 through 2016 um, sequencing was very important early on in understanding the emergence of 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 the virus and how it came from animals and, and how it spread between the countries um, when um, at the peak of the the outbreak, sequencing was was wasn't quite as as, as useful there were, there were just too many cases. Um, and too much to do, um, but um, when the cases started to come down again, um, 
uh, the programs in, I believe, all three countries um, started um, sequencing all of the cases uh, once again. And um, I was actually working with the with 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 the group in Guinea. I was uh, deployed to, to to Guinea with them, and, and I can tell you, doing that was actually a, a extremely valuable um, uh, because about every fifth case that we were uh, running into in, in Guinea at, at that particular time. So this was around summer of 2015, was a case that we couldn't link to to other cases epidemiologically. There was a there was a huge amount of distrust of of government and and, and authority there in in Guinea for 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 historic reasons, um, and um, so uh, it, it was sometimes hard to, to to get the information that that we needed in order to make the connections epidemiologically. But with uh, genomic sequencing, we could actually um, tell where the where the infections came from, and this allowed us to more effectively, you know, target you know where where our, where our staff were and, and 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 what they were focused on. And I think it's going to be the same thing here now with with, with COVID nineteen. So you know, we've we've used it, we used it for Ebola, we used it for Zika. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, we, we we're using it constantly for for antimicrobially resistant infections. With COVID, it, as as Duncan talked about in in his part of the talk, it was very useful early on in understanding where the virus came from here in the U.S. You know, um, uh, we're actually about to put out a um, an article in our um, MMWR publication probably on Tuesday. Although we're we're still working out the the, the day of the publication, which which looks at early transmission. Of COVID nineteen in the United States, and and the sequence data was actually very important to to understanding that. Um, I think um, similar to with with Ebola, as cases start to come down again, um, it's actually going to be um, very valuable in state health departments in helping them understand how um, uh, uh, in, in understanding tran transmission and in, in in those contact investigations, you know, in confirming, for example, that a that you know a, a case came from another known case, in understanding you know uh, how many chains of transmission there are in in in, in the community and and um, uh, you know how effectively they're 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 shutting down those chains of transmission. Um, so you know this is. Um, um, we're actually coming into a phase right now where, where the the fact that the states have gotten these funds and they have and they are facile with this technology because they've been using it in other areas, um, I think is actually going to put us in a much better. Great. Um, so we had another question come in. Um, are there uh, any plans to expand spheres uh, beyond the twenty seven state health departments? That are currently participating, and maybe as a second part of that, um, what really is the next level that you envision for the program, um, particularly if resources were not um, an issue? Sure, uh, I can definitely take that one. Um, you know, we started out with about sixteen public health departments that were that were initially interested, and you know, it's already grown to twenty-seven. I, I think our our goal was absolutely to hit uh, hit all 50 states and to to expand to include most county and large municipalities because you know many of these have genomic capability many are interested. Um, you know the reality though was especially in the early days of the pandemic, uh, most labs were were grappling with the demands of, of diagnostic testing. They were trying to figure out um, you know resources and staffing and sequencing was pretty far down the, the priority list. Um, now that I think in many cases uh, those those processes are more ironed out, now that there are some additional resources to support uh, sequencing efforts, uh, I think we're starting to see many more states uh, st show interest. And as Greg said, you know, we because we've already ceded a lot of capacity in in states to actually perform genomic testing uh, at this level, um, I, I suspect that number of 27 will go up fairly substantially. Uh, that that actually has increased by about five states since last week. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's growing fairly quickly. And ideally, uh, to bring it to the next level, you know, I think if you compare what we're trying to do with, with some of the other national efforts that have been announced, like COG UK, the, the UK COVID Genomics Consortium, 
um, they have certain structural advantages in their country that, that allow them to, to, hand, to have much more centralized data collection, data management. Um, you know, I think next step for us really is going to be trying to ensure that we, we have as broad data collection as possible, uh, that it's as consistent as possible, and ideally uh, that we have some sort of ability to link these data back to, uh, to epidemiologic data in near real time right, as much as possible. A lot of those uh, basic data use agreements and the, the metadata that's actually required to actually do that is, is challenging because it requires a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, groundwork to actually get that up and running quickly. Um, but our goal is really to be able to put the data into the hands of, uh, of responders as quickly as possible. One of the biggest challenges is really connecting samples with sequencing and getting the data back to, uh, to people that can actually make, a, make decisions and respond to them. Uh, we have a few jurisdictions now that are that are exploring this. Uh, Michigan, for example, uh, Michigan State Public Health Lab is is working on uh, real time uh, viral genomic surveillance and whether or not they can actually use that to direct public health resources. A few of the Bay Area counties have also uh, have also been exploring that, uh, and in Boston, just to name a few. Uh, but really, that what is required there is rapid, uh, really good coordination between. Uh, the people that are collecting the samples, the primary diagnostic testing that's identifying positives, uh, the sequencing lab, the bioinformatics, and you know actually turning that into something that the uh, the epidemiologists and the frontline public health staff can respond to, and uh, that's an area of challenge. It's it's an area that uh, you know I think we're starting to see success. Uh, we would love to see success at an, on a national level, but right. there's many well, different I systems think, that have um, to work that through. Just gets us to through all work. of the questions we have received. Um, so now, just to, um, in closing, I want to um, thank again our distinguished speakers this afternoon. I want to thank all of you for joining us. So to learn more about the CDC SPHERES um, program and the AMD program, you can visit the links you see here, and we will certainly um, share all of these with all of you who attended today in a follow-up email. Um, we also have links here uh, to a uh, COVID-19 resources page that we at ASM maintain. I encourage you to check that out um, if you haven't already. Uh, you can access a wealth of science-based information and other educational tools on the virus. Um, and also as a reminder, um, we are going to be posting a recording of today's webinar online. Lastly, we do have a public health, uh, a precision health fact sheet uh, on AMD that we also can share with you following the uh, program and that you see the link to here. And lastly, Alan mentioned um, in his opening remarks that um, starting next week, we'll be hosting a three-part virtual briefing series um, really building on a scientific summit ASM held in late March that focused on uh, the science behind COVID-19 diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. Um, more to come and registration links will be available in the next day or two, but want to make you aware of these upcoming webinars uh, that you see here and hope that um, many of you can join us for those. Um, so with that, we will um, end today's program. Thank you again for joining us and appreciate all that you do. Have a nice afternoon. <music>